Thank you very much. So we've got some obligatory questions that we have to go through with each of the nominees. And let me start first, and we'll have to hear from all of you. Is there anything that you're aware of in your background that might present a conflict of interest with the duties of the office to which you've been nominated? Ms. Rawlinson. No. No. Second, do you know of any reason, personal or otherwise, <clears throat> that would in any way prevent you from fully and honorably discharging the responsibilities of the office to which you've been nominated? No. No. Third, do you agree without reservation to respond to any reasonable <clears throat> summons to appear and testify before any duly constituted committee of the Congress if you're confirmed? Yes. 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 Finally, do you commit to uh, provide a prompt response in writing to any questions addressed to you by any senators of this committee? Yes. 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 Okay. Let's go to the questions. I'm going to start with you, Ms. Rawlinson, and talk about uh, the implications for the IRS if there is a government shutdown. Now, you were there at the agency during that time when the chief counsel's office was coming in and out of, you know, government uh, uh, shutdowns and you're aware that uh, the IRS in these kinds of instances has to furlough existing staff. What I wanted to ask you, though, is what does the shutdown mean for millions of taxpayers? And I'm talking about small businesses. I'm talking about veterans. I'm talking about seniors. The millions and millions of typical taxpayers who can't get their questions answered, their returns and refunds processed, the kind of information they need to uh, address their hopes and plans for their future and put it in the context, you know, so much of what goes on around here, and Senator Crapo and I talk about this, the government, you know, talks about all kinds of technical lingo. I don't want to do that with this question. I want you to take your best and most experienced take. What's this going to mean for the small businesses and the veterans and the seniors if the government shuts down? Thank you so much. I, uh, I think your staff was particularly alarmed when I told them that I started during a government shutdown and then left when there was a government shutdown. So I have been there for two government shutdowns in the, in the past. And I will say that um, from the perspective of the chief counsel, it is, it is concerning in terms of making sure that we're going to be staffed. But your question about looking at it from the taxpayers is one that I've seen played out uh, today in many of the news reports, people debating just, just how big of an impact is it on people right away when the government shuts down. And I think that is something that needs to be considered very carefully. From the perspective of the Office of Chief Counsel, it means uh, making tough decisions about what work will get done while the government is shut Free, down. Freeze frame that. So as counsel, mm -hmm. you're facing questions of Will we be able to do this for veterans or that for seniors? And maybe we have to put it off or something like that. Is that the kind of uh, choice that you saw people having to make? Thank you. What, when I was there, uh, the, the workers were divided between essential and non-essential. I think they've gotten rid of that title because it was just a little bit offensive to the people who were told they were non-essential. Um, but yes, choices have to be made about what work can get done while the government is shut down. And it can have an impact on ongoing litigation. It can have an impact on um, <clears throat> guidance to the, to the field. It can have a very direct impact. And I just want to make sure that when you talk about litigation and, and impact, you're telling us that coming in and out of government and going, going through that, this is not some abstract issue. This is something that's real for the millions of typical taxpayers. We're still apparently wait, awaiting more guidance from the government, but based on everything I've heard, and you've been through them, this is real for those millions of people. You know, the taxpayers in my state, 
are basically 3,000 miles away from Washington, D.C. And for them, Washington, D.C. most of the time might as well be Mars for the impact it has on them. But I think what I've heard from you in the past and you know, others is that for those seniors, those veterans, those small businesses, this isn't an abstract issue. This can really uh, have a damaging effect on their lives and their future. Is that correct? Yeah, I think you raise a okay. very good point. Very good. Ms. Newman, just a question for you and my colleagues remember this. And uh, we're so thrilled working with Chairman Hatch because I went to the chairman and I said, you know, when I was coming up as director of the Gray Panthers, Medicare had part A and part B. Part A was hospitals. If you broke your ankle, I went to school on basketball scholarships, saw a lot of those. Mm -hmm. um, people who were still recovering from, you know, injuries that they sustained when they were young. And, uh, and then part B was for the doctors. You had a horrible case of the flu. So the three of us working with, you know, Chairman Hatch and a lot of <laughs> colleagues over here, Senator, Carner, Senator Cardin, Senator Warner, we said, the future of Medicare is gonna be the millions of seniors who have two or more chronic conditions. You know, maybe they have cancer, diabetes, heart, these kinds of things. So we wrote a major bill that I think is really transformative. And I'd be interested in your uh, thoughts about the impact and how your work will be affected from these kinds of emerging trends in American health care. You know, obviously can't get into a specific bill or that. But what I can tell you is the Medicare program of today is not the Medicare program when I was coming up as director of the Great Panthers. So how do you factor in these emerging trends? Thank you for that question, Senator. I'm glad you're bringing, you have brought so much attention to the issue of an aging population with people with more chronic conditions, living longer with more chronic conditions, and the importance of doing something to better manage care for people as they grow older. This is an important issue, it's an important issue for, for Medicare, it's an important issue for medical care. I think any one of us who may have family members with diabetes or hypertension or cancer, heart disease, understand just how important it is to better manage care, work across specialties so that people get the best possible care and that certain conditions are prevented, um, also an important factor. As a public trustee, I think the focus would be um, somewhat narrower. I think on the one hand, a public trustee would look at the extent to which chronic conditions drive spending and affect spending. And on the flip side, I think a public trustee would want to look at the effect of any interventions or policy changes or regulations that may actually <clears throat> slow the growth in Medicare spending. My, my, my time's expired. We're going to have some suggestions because I know, for example, I've been talking to my colleagues and you know, professionals in the field. If there were grab bars, for example, for elderly folks, that could prevent a lot of incredibly harmful falls, which devastate lives and cost enormous sums of money. Those are the kinds of things we're going to want to talk to you about. 